All right. So we have three groups of people in here. The people who got drunk last night and said, fuck it. The people who did not drink last night, such as myself. And the people who came straight here from the party. So I want to see those people. Who came straight from a party? No, nobody. What happened at DEF CON? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, for what it's worth, I was sleeping by 11. I didn't kick anyone out of anywhere. So there you go. All right. So we have a very, very cool talk. I'm actually going to sit and listen to this one, which I don't always do. So my friend Dennis Geis, Geis, Giza is going to talk about how to hack a robot vacuum. All right. Um, thank you very much for being here at 10 a.m. in the morning on a Sunday. Um, Everyone who had talk, uh, talked to me over the last past days, I always say, like, hey, don't go to the talks, just watch a live recording, but unfortunately, I need to be here. Uh, but great that you're here, so um, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so um, today I will do another vacuum robot uh, talk, and uh, this time we take a look at robots which have cameras. And I know this is like every two years, it's more or less sounds like the same talk, but sadly, there's always a lot of development, and the vendors are not the smartest ones always. Um, so, see, is this an update? All right, um, so um, some information about me so that you have some idea what the heck I'm doing. Um, I'm a PhD student in Boston at Northeastern University and I primarily do uh, research in uh, wireless and uh, embedded devices. So I'm interested in uh, security and privacy. Um, I think I call myself now also a vacuum robot collector because I have many, many, many of them. So some people collect stamps, I collect vacuum robots. Um, and I'm interested in reverse engineering interesting uh, devices. Um, robots, obviously, but uh, right now I'm also looking at smart speakers, flash memory, everything which is kind of interesting, has internet and can do uh, interesting things. Um, some of my um, past projects, to give you some idea why I'm doing things, how I do them, um, I had like a paper some time ago um, about Amazon Echo devices where I did forensics about like 87 or 86 used devices from eBay and was doing forensics on them. Let's say the outcome was not very good for Amazon. Um, some other things which I do right now is like flash forensics, so I look at embedded devices and see what kind of information I can extract from them. Um, but I'm looking also at flash firmware itself. So flash memory has sometimes firmware onto it, and I'm looking if I can, you know, use it for something interesting. Um, another project which I run primarily is uh, robotinfo.dev. Um, this is like a website where you have like a systematic, you know, list of uh, robots which I have, um, sorted by operation systems, sensors, vulnerabilities. Um, my primary um, focus here is like security and privacy, um, and one of the things which I also do with that um, is also tracking of firmware changes. We will see later that um, tracking of firmware changes can be very, very useful and can save you a lot of time. Um, yeah. Um, one of the stories how I get my information is, I mean, I have the devices myself, and then as soon as I disconnect them from, from the cloud, I basically emulate them in the cloud, so the vendor thinks that they're still online, but I just use it to scrape the data. Um, and this is also like a base for um, further research. Um, as you can see in the picture, by the way, this is like one of my two or three shelves which I have. So I have from each of the robots which I root, I have like a reference model. If I need to test something, just go to my shelf, just grab one, test whatever I want, and just put it back on the shelf. Which means I have no idea which robot cleans the best because I'm root of them, but I don't actually use them for cleaning. So I get this question quite often. I, I have no idea. I have one which cleans, it, it's fine. So uh, no idea about that. Um, all right, so what's the goal of this talk? Um, I want to give you some um, overview of the development of vacuum robot hacking over the last five years. Um, I want to give you also some, some insight of vulnerabilities and vectors, and I want to give you an idea about the current um, uh, routing methods for current robots. Um, the ultimate goal which we have typically is that we have root access at some point on a robot without disassembling it, because disassembly is always warranty seals and stuff. Um, one quick notice. Um, we don't necessarily hate um, the robot companies. I mean, it's like more or less like a competition. Sometimes I visited them and had a nice chat, and next week I rooted their devices. So it's, it's kind of nice. So it's a, it's a nice um, kind of thing. So um, what kind of devices were uh, covered today in the talk? Um, and there's a kind of long list. Technically, there's even a longer list. But um, primarily, we have the companies Roborock, uh, we have Dreamy. Um, a lot of things which I do today apply also to many, many, many other devices, not only vacuum robots, but um, lawnmowers, smart speakers, and other things. Um, 
all the devices which are underlined are ones which uh, have cameras. Um, and the ones which are indirectly is like, um, technically I have it, but it doesn't make sense for me to actually root it and develop tooling. So if you want to port it, you can do it, but um, yeah, just as information. So um, let's talk about this talk. Um, so the, this talk is more or less the result of like 15 months of research and experiments. So I do that for a very long time. And it's a little bit annoying to sit on things for a very long time. So if you know like, okay, I can get access on this device, but I can't tell anyone how. Um, which is very annoying. Um, and also this talk is a, a collaborative effort between me and Zuren Bayer. And Zuren is one of the, or is the developer of Valetudo, which is the cloud replacement for robots. Uh, so he uh, plays a very, very important role in this, um, in this endeavor. Um, the other thing is, all this work wouldn't be uh, possible if you wouldn't have the community. So we have thousands of people who are making robots and who are like, tinkering around with them. I cannot have every device so far, and uh, how, uh, thankfully people are testing things, and this is kind of great. Um, as a general information, um, in this talk, you're the, you learn about vulnerabilities the same time as the vendors do. So right now I know that some companies in China are watching this talk live, and I will get some emails afterwards. Um, but expect some patches coming in the next days, so they don't know what we do. So just as information. All right. So what's the motivation for this talk? Um, well, why do we root devices in the first place? And a lot of people think like, okay, I mean, you can just use it. Why, why the heck do I need to root it? Well, these devices are very, very cool hardware. Think of uh, um, a Raspberry Pi on tires, uh, which has tires like cool sensors and can drive around in your apartment. Um, it's a very compact, nice unit, um, which you can you know, do a lot of experiments with. Um, the other thing is we obviously want to stop devices from constantly uh, phoning home. And you will be surprised how much we phone home. So it's like one device can produce hundreds of megabytes of log files, maps, whatever, every month, which is like getting uploaded. So if you have a, uh, um, some um, internet tariff which has um, um, limitations of like volume, you might think about that. Um, the other thing is uh, a lot of people like to have um, some custom smart home solutions. So like um, Home Assistant is one of the examples. It makes it way easier to obviously connect the device if you have um, a root device. Um, a thing which becomes more and more important uh, also with the right of repair, um, by rooting devices or having the tools at least to be able to do so, we can diagnose broken devices. Um, especially in the US there's a problem that you have a warranty of one year and these robots tend to break after one year, so um, it's very useful that we can figure out, okay, what's, what's going on with devices. And we want to verify also privacy claims. Companies can say a lot of things if the day is long, and marketing people can do that too, but we want to actually know if it's true or not. So why don't we trust the nice companies, and why don't we trust IoT? Well, Imagine this device is connected to your home network and has access to everything which is in your home if it's in the same network. And it has its own internet connection, basically, to back to the cloud. Which means, um, in most of the time, the, this communication is encrypted and you have no idea what's sending back. It has cameras, it ha might have microphones, it, might, it has a, you know, a map of your home, it can drive around on its own, and you have no idea what's running on it. Also, even if the vendor is not malicious, uh, developing secure hardware and software is uh, really hard. And if you remember the Marai, net, uh, frame, um, the Marai botnet, um, where basically a lot of IP cameras got hacked and millions of, you know, basically botnets were created. Um, this is kind of like a thing where we want to just make sure that, you know, there's nothing, you know, which the vendor accidentally left in there and forgot about. Um, and one of the things is also that a lot of vendor claims uh, contradict each other, and I have one perfect example for that. Um, which I always use, so it's like uh, if, you, if you were here in, uh, two years ago, you probably know it, uh, just you know, for the newcomers. Um, Roborock, I mean, I, I shame a little bit Roborock, but all the companies do that, by the way. Um, they claim for their robots with cameras, nothing is ever sent to the cloud. Um, we will never duplicate data, the data is not stored on the device, and we don't send, send pictures. The camera is just used to kind of detect but if you scroll down on a page back then, you find like, oh, by the way, you can also access the camera remotely to watch your pets. So, okay, so you're not sending it to the cloud, but I can still access it remotely, so how do you work? Um, another thing um, which came out, uh, iRobot got that they
devices, so PIP3 devices, and had some terms of service where we but no one that they agree to that. And so people started to kind of, uh, um, so this device started to put pictures and for whatever reason, iRobot was very interested in that, that you had like a, you know, fan and like lights in your, in your apartment. For whatever reason they wanted. Um, one fact of that is as soon as the article came out or shortly, started to pass so firmware changes. Nowadays, is um, devices get more and more sensors, and I have an example here from Echovac. Don't talk about this talk today, but just an ex as an example, they have cameras, but they started also to introduce microphones. Um, we made like five years ago with Daniel um, uh, Wegema, who was starting this research. Um, oh, we can use ultrasonic sensor as a microphone, so we can spy on people, or we can use some other sensors to, you know, get like some audio information or like you know visual information. Nowadays, we are here basically like, oh, we have cameras and microphones already on board, so we don't need to kind of think of like sketchy ways to kind of get to the audio stream. Um, right. Another thing which we need to talk about is what, what are the risks of, uh, the, of devices with cameras. Um, a lot of devices might store uh, pictures indefinitely um, and basically both in the cloud and locally. And from what I can tell so far is Many do so. So basically, um, I have like a research project running where we look at you know uh, what kind of data is like stored where, and um, a lot of pictures are stay, staying basically forever. Um, the other thing which might be problematic is if you are a um, shopper at Mar Amazon Marketplace and you get like used devices. Um, I'm not sure if it's a good idea, um, partially because whoever had the device before could have installed a rootkit. And you as a new owner, you have no idea what's, what's going on there. So even if you do a factory set, the, the malicious firmware might still be on. With the result that you have a malicious firmware, uh, sorry, malicious device in your network, which has you know, all the access. Um, by the way, if you learn today how to root devices, don't buy Amazon devices. Root them and send them back. That's evil, that's bad, that's hopefully, I think that's illegal. So uh, don't do that, very bad. All right, so, which means rooting is very five other devices clean. Uh, so literally no other way to kind of know that. Um, by the way, the vendors are kind of aware that, pe that people and uh, cybersecurity uh, um, people are kind of scared of cameras. So they try to avoid the word camera. So instead, um, you know, they say like, oh, we, this device doesn't have a camera, we have um, optical sensor. And I have here an article from like a German thing, but uh, a German page, but um, there's also um, English speaking pages which have like, you know, marketing material from Roborock. And I kind of said like, well, we don't have a camera in the actual sense. We have an optical sensor which detects a couple of things. Well, on the right you see an output of this optical sensor. Uh, looks kind of to me like a picture, but I mean, it must be, it must be an optical sensor, so. The other thing is everyone loves certifications, so all the devices we're talking about today uh, have some sort of certification by my favorite company in Germany, TÜV, certifying a lot of um, And all of the devices are uh, certified by the European uh, cybersecurity standards for uh, products. So I think once we're certified, we can stop the talk because we're secure, I assume. Um, yeah, so the takeaway lesson at some point just to kind of, you know, give you already like a spoiler is uh, don't trust certifications. Uh, they don't necessarily mean anything. All right, so what happened so far uh, in the past over the last five years? Well, one of the I was every released, uh, the vendors react in one way or the other. Um, sometimes they even break things in the process. So I, we saw in the past like a vendor which kind of panicked a little bit when they used the routing method and they created a firmware update which started to break hundreds of vacuum robots. Um, breaks randomly so you let it it will stop randomly after five minutes or ten minutes or whatever we will see a, we'll show an example in a, you know um, in the next slides um, where we saw that 
or the device might also destroy it themselves. So some, uh, we saw in one case where basically if the device detects that it has been rooted, it will just, you know, destroy itself, uh, which is bad. Um, all right, let's look in the past. The first work um, of the training which I was doing uh, was in 2017. And this was together with Danny Wigema. By the way, talk in, at 11 a.m. So it in, um, uh, I think he does uh, ship sets, uh, like wireless ship sets. Um, when he has a talk in um, and the um, the robot which we were back when analyzing was the first generation of Xiaomi robots and the first generation of Robo robots. Um, some of the things which we figured out is that the firmware updates are unsigned and um, encrypted with a very weak key, which was I think the company name Roborock, which wouldn't it's itself be an issue on its own. I mean that's kind of like not great, but I mean the bigger problem was that you could push custom firmware from the local network onto the device. Uh, and because the, 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 you know, the thing was kind of clear, uh, so the, the password was kind of known, people could do that maliciously. You cannot do only work, but you can also from I was telling this story like where um, I was in Germany and I saw one of the a robot. So it's I just want to say I didn't do it, but you can do that. So devices that uh, the CCC in 2017, and I was giving a talk exactly five years ago on the day here at DEF CON. So um, it's, a, it's a very long run of you know, research. So after that, Roborock was, let's say, not directly happy. We started to do a couple things. Um, for example, we blocked the local updates, which was not necessarily bad. I mean, I think from a security perspective, this was good. Um, then they started to introduce with newer firmware um, signatures, uh, signed also packages. And they use different keys for different devices, so we couldn't, you know, the firmware for different devices anymore with one key. Um, one thing which we didn't like, um, they started to sign files for blocks, so by device designer, you couldn't run less, you know, crack down on that. Remain the same. So if you buy a device like from five years ago and you buy a device from like two years ago, they have more or less the same board. The same. Uh, that's kind of a business model of, you know, generating revenue. Um, the bad news. and do the Uber shell thing, so which you can do for many, many devices, um, to get root access. And an de develop a method where you can basically bring the device in boot and just start to patch it from, uh, the, the system from there. Um, the disadvantage was obviously we need to disassemble it, potentially screwing, so it's um, kind of a problem. One of the interesting facts is this method still works today for many, many devices which are based on the all winner R16 um, chipset. Um, so even if you buy today uh, newer Roborock Q7, it still works for whatever reason. So that's a good thing. Um, obviously, one of the things is we moved like the U-boot shell. So access machine learning models, you can access, you know, anything which is on the device. And they started to put these keys into a uh, trust zone. So uh, you need to boot in secure boot mode uh, so, so that you can access the keys. So they put a lot of effort in like, securing that. One thing which, they, which was very clean is they to put like stuff in the kernel. For example, they added so you couldn't run any uh, unsigned binaries, which is a little bit annoying if you got some way in and tried to run something you have and it just says like, no, it's not science, so screw you. Um, all right, so in 2020, uh, so which is very, very, so it's a thing which, you know, a very small percentage of do, but it's very tricky. 
Um, also back in 2021, because we got a little bit tired with Roborock and their measurements, uh, we um, and their devices were kind of powerful um, because we had cameras and other things. Um, they were easy to root just by um, by USB. Um, but the problem was a little bit that the devices got soft, soft break from time to time, but we kind of fixed that. So what was the Roborox reaction? Except one day after uh, the uh, DEF CON talk, I got a e nice email from the Roborox team. Thanks for the talk. Our engineers were watching the talk live, so I assume we're watching it right now. And they're fixing right now the vulnerabilities and pushing out the update. Um, encrypted for the edition, which they can't. Um, they started to obfuscate the ELF binary verification. Um, it cost us more time to figure out what they did. And they added some code to detect that we root devices and to bypass um, our traffic. So typically what we do is like we, when we disconnect the device from the cloud, we reroute the traffic so that it ends up in our custom software. They figured out a way to detect that and basically still send out the traffic to the real Roborock servers, um, which was very mean. I mean, we figured it out, but it was kind of like a little bit weird, like, wait, we rooted this device, why is it still sending stuff back home? Uh, so they basically put hooks, like put hooks in the literal library. Um, so some HTTP requests happening, they, they match for, is it the Roborock URL? If it is, then do like a silent DNS check themselves and kind of, you know, send it like silently. And we are big fans of XOR, so they XOR took the, like everything out of like all the strings and from all the binaries. So um, they really want to make it hard for us that we don't use strings on the you know. Um, as an example for their creativity, so they uh, like I mentioned before, they added um, elf signature checks in the kernel. And what we do is typically we uh, we map the uh, do mm map um, function, which creates I think the. the Great DSP um, and all the other names. It's kind of like if you look at it, that's, you know, that be there. But in reality, we try just to kind of key and obfuscate things. They get really, really creative with the names. Uh, but not creative enough. If you Google for these functions, you not, don't find anything except for Rock. So, uh, well, be a little bit more creative. Um, Dreamy panicked also at this time. Um, they were kind of new. They um, did a lot of changes to the firmware, so they pushed like one firmware update after another. They removed our UART login shell and they patched the U-boot shell. Um, and some of the changes apparently did break a lot of robots. Um, there was like some kind of thing which we didn't test it properly. We pushed the firmware update and a lot of robots were kind of very sad afterwards. Um, a fun fact is um, their patches revealed a way to manage to root the devices which we actually knew. So one thing which we do is we, um, you know, and see like did they change? This happens fully automatic. And um, one thing which we noticed like, oh, they, they, they changed this thing. Um, so we would um, kind of do like a sketchy way to like of, of, of the, the robot by USB. And if USB cable is kind of janky, it might break the robot. So it's very very dangerous. Then we saw that we patched the function out, which basically if you press the reset button for like one second, it will shell. Um, and we saw that and we were like. Great, this is way safer because you had, I mean, you kind of things that, that easily. So uh, thanks, Dreamy, for telling us about this thing. So we, did, we weren't even aware of that. I mean, I didn't have any idea that this exists in there. Um, introduced measurements. Um, one was, but obviously, we enabled secure boot and set of if uses, which was kind of to be. Um, they started to sign the um, system partition in a weird way and verified it in the bootloader. And they started to pair the kernel with a particular uh, version of file system, um, which on itself is not a problem, but the next step is kind of the annoying part. They in, um, introduced um, judge, we call it like that, countermeasure into the software. What, was this, what is this judge doing? Well, it's, they introduced it in all the firmware in 2022, and it will was cleaning the detects and manipulation of the firmware. So what it does is it uh, um, has like an expected SHA-256 value and it baked into the kernel. And the process, um, uh, as soon as you start to run it, it will basically compute a hash of the If a match, it will create a thread which will allocate lots of lots of memories for a random time. It's not easy, but it's like three minutes, it can be 15 minutes, it can be anything. This, the robot will just stop and crash and reboot. And 
imagine how difficult it is to, to figure that out. Uh, it took us like like weeks to figure out like, wait, is this like a thing which is we messed up something? But, but we messed up and be sneaky and you know, kind of uh, but. Okay, so what is the current state of robot security today? Um, and I have an example here, um, which is probably one of the most or best protected uh, robots so far on the market, which is the Roborock um, S8 Pro, which is, I think, the top on the stack. Um, it's the current flagship model. It came out a couple months ago. Um, it's a, it has a, a um, quad-core all-winner SOC and multiple MCUs. Um, we got a little bit cheap, so the initial models came out of one gigabyte of RAM, but at some point we figured out, like, oh, hey, we can get away with 512, so newer releases have, like, 512 megabyte of RAM. Um, we have four gigabyte flash, we have two cameras, a um, LiDAR sensor, and uh, two lasers. Security-wise, we kind of booked, checked everything in the book, basically. Secure boot, uh, the MVRT, protected rootfs, looks and crook partitions, as Linux of signatures, so um, the standard stuff, what we have. Um, let me give you a quick intro how the booting process looks like. And this is a very simplified version. I know it, it, at the end of the day it will look very, very complicated, but just to, for you to understand, okay, what, we, what are we doing, what is our leverage? Um, if, the, if the device boots up, uh, it boots from a boot ROM which is baked into the SOC. Uh, it will then verify the first stage bootloader, which initializes also RAM, and the first stage bootloader will then check the signature of like a thing which is called TOC1. This is like just a term, technical term, ignore that for now. The TOC1, what it will do is it will like, uh, start the um, trust zone components, OPT in this particular case, which will then verify and the actual um, um, bootloader. Uh, the UBoot bootloader gets like, configuration and um, for example, which partition to boot and will launch and verify uh, the Linux kernel. The Linux kernel itself will then verify the root file system and check if it's correctly signed, and we'll start the, all the software, which it will also check if it's correctly signed. So the software itself, the ELF binaries are signed. Then we used OPT to retrieve keys for the system partitions and for the data partition, and we'll decrypt the uh, software partition and user data partition. So there's a lot of stuff in there, and it's like, all right, everything checks everything, so what the heck do, are, are we doing here, right? Well, actually, uh, there's one thing which is maybe not checked in the way it should be checked. The boot, let's talk about the bootloader. So the bootloader is more or less a standard thing for embedded devices. It's a very powerful software. It sets up some hardware at, at, at the boot, boot up process. It sends uh, the uh, command line arguments for the kernel. It verifies the kernel in this particular case, boots it, um, and it uses environment or configuration to configure itself. For example, it's, it's used for um, if you want to update like a partition, you have typically two copies of a partition. If you want to update copy B, uh, you can control it over U-boot. On the other side, U-boot has a very powerful command set. It can do a lot of things. For example, allowing to um, load partitions, access memory, changing memory, because sometimes you need that to um, set up hardware. Um, the thing which I was wondering about was like, huh, okay, it can access and change memory. I wonder if we can use that for something. So the idea was, can we ask U-boot nicely to modify itself? So the theory is if you have memory reads and writes, um, we might be able to overwrite instructions in the U-boot itself, which, for example, checks, verifies like, the kernel signature. So what, we had to do a little bit of math, so we have to figure out like, basically where the actual signature function, which was a little bit tricky to figure out if you don't have the source code. Um, then we have to figure out the uh, U-boot relocation uh, offset, because we, you know, um, there's some technical reason behind that. And so we need to figure where is this in the memory? And then at the end of the day, um, we figured out where it is, and then we patch, basically, we set, we set two bytes in, the, in one particular memory location, and it say disables all the verifications uh, forward after. The interesting thing is, the, the, the still in secure boot mode, nothing notices that something is going wrong, everything is fine. So what's the consequence of that? And if we go back into our original example, if we have a malicious U-boot configuration, well, um, U-boot patches itself, so U-boot is compromised. Um, because we have U-boot compromised, we compromise the verification check. Then we can compromise the kernel because nothing is checking it anymore. If we compromise the kernel, then the kernel doesn't check anymore the system or the software. 
and because opt never learns that anything bad happened, uh, it will happily give us the keys which we need to do the partitions um, and uh, everything works. So this system is more or less screwed. So what did we achieve with this small one line thing? Uh, we bypassed the secure boot process. Um, we modified the kernel, um, which means we removed the DM verity checks, we removed the elf binary checks, and we uh, disabled SE Linux. And this allows us uh, to modify the root system, so we're back in it, basically. And uh, with that, to install um, custom software and get SSH access. The interesting thing is when we were playing around with this model, uh, with this uh, approach, I mean, it's kind of known that uh, the environment partitions is kind of like a problem, but most of the time we use shell scripts and just patch the U-boot persistently, um, and not only on vacuum robots, but we tested this also for smart speakers, media devices, um, and many, many other devices. So if you happen uh, um, to have a device which uses U-boot and, you know, which is kind of locked and you might want to try it. It's a little bit of effort in like getting it to run initially, but it's definitely worth it. So we still have a problem. Well, how do we modify um, the environment? Because I mean, it's like on a flash, so we, we hit on this. Well, without root access, we, we can scary. So as a, a quick recap, if you have been here two years ago, um, Dreamy uh, thankfully has debug pins which are reachable from outside, so you can just remove like a cover. It sounds a little bit scary if you kind of remove, like, pull on it the first time, but it's very easily removable. It gives you a UART, it gives you like USB, it gives you everything. Um, the same is the case, I mean, we never changed it for the new models, for the R models, which are the ones that came after 2022. They still use the same thing. So. Um, again, a thing which we kind of figured out by looking at firmware updates, uh, Jimmy left us a nice backdoor. Um, basically, if you connect a USB stick, an empty USB stick, it doesn't matter what USB stick it is, um, to the USB port, it will pop a shell. And at some point, I think they plan to have some actual verification there. But as you see, it's, if the verification fails, it still gets you a shell. So I think this was a work in progress, and someone forgot about that. Um, so that way, we as you see, it, it doesn't matter if the if is, is, is doing anything or not, uh, you will always get a shell. Um, so after you get uh, access basically to the shell, you can just patch environment and you're good to go. Um, the sad news is they, for whatever reason, they have two branches and for the newer R models in 2022, they don't, uh, they, they have like a more, a, b a better check and uh, so it doesn't work there. Instead, uh, we developed this method uh, where we basically bring the um, bootloader, uh, so the device into a particular bootloader mode, and then we have a weird, sketchy firmware package we install very sketchy there. It doesn't actually install any firmware, but it gives you an interface uh, to the flash and to some other system functions, which surprisingly, uh, if you um, connect over USB in the bootloader mode, you don't need to have signed firmware. So you can execute unsigned code over USB, you don't have access to Trust Zone, but that's fine for us. We just just want to have access to the Flash and from just modify the Flash. So um, it, um, I have a how to here. The technical process is a little bit complicated, but we did like lots of pictures, and so um, don't worry. I mean, many people did that already and tested it, thankfully, and didn't break their devices. Well, but we fixed it, so it should be safe. At this time, it should be safe. I kind of promise. Um, if you want to get an adapter, I have some adapters with me. Um, you can just grab one. Um, sadly, I, I, I got rid of 100 adapters two days ago in my demo session, but I still have some left. Um, otherwise, you find the Gerber files on this website. Let's talk about this scary FAL route. Um, the problem with is they didn't give us any exposed debug pins. So we have only like USB available from outside, which we cannot really use. So the first approach, which I typically do is all right, I buy the device, I spend $1,000 and disassemble it and you know, analyze it. I, I remove the SOC, which is hundreds of pins, and try to track on which, which um, I remove so to the EMMC to, to kind of figure out. I start to uh, map all the pins, like visual, I use my hacking software MS Paint and kind of overlay the pictures. 
and uh, rotate one so that I can basically trace down like, okay, this is the data line from the EMMC, it goes in this via, and it comes out on the other side, as you can see, uh, ah, the picture is a little bit weird. It comes out, out from the other side, and you know, so you can basically connect uh, these pictures. One thing which out, and Roborock was very, very great with layouting it, um, you can access all the EMMC data pins from the whole, from the button, which is, you just remove the cover, there's a, just, just some rubber thing, you don't need to disassemble the robot, no warranty seals are broken, you can access the data pins from outside, which is great for us. So as you see, we have uh, data zero, data one, and all the other pins, the clock, we have everything, which is very nice. So now we come to the scary part. Um, we can use a needle to basically um, ground the data zero pin to, uh, to, to uh, well, connect the data zero pin to ground, and that will bring the device into um, the bootloader, and then we can just flash it from So I'm touching any single screw, you can just, you know, you scratch off a little bit of solar mask, you connect like a wire to it, you just hold it, and power it on, and then it should be in, 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 the, in the bootloader mode. Um, so it's more or less the same approach for the Dreamy, so it's like um, just in this particular case, you need to be a little bit more scary. Um, why is it scary? Well, it requires removal of solar mask, you need to scratch a little bit. If, you don't, if you're not comfortable with that, you still need to tear down, um, but if you're unsure, ask other users, there's a lot of people who um, if you have a different uh, robot uh, from Roborock, um, like a G10S, which is very often used in Russia right now, I heard, um, it's more or less the same process as for the other robots, but you need to disassemble it because we don't have any access from outside. I checked all the, you know, possibilities of like burning holes into the board, but sadly that doesn't work. Um, so um, check out my website, robot, the pinouts, and ask uh, for help in the community. Right. Um, what do we do with root access? Um, so. We have root access now in some way, so what do we do now? We defeated Secure Boot, we can run custom software, but what kind of software can we run and can we build our own software which does everything? Well, the main idea is, well, we want to do the cloud, keep all the vendor clinic logic in place because, I mean, we are not software engineers, so we, you know. Um, the problem is like we use obviously secrets uh, uh, or, or keys, and so we need to extract them from the robot and point it like to like a cloud emulation. So it's a little bit tricky, right? But we can do that. So the initial approach which we had was quite naive. So we just redirect DNS to our own software, and you know we just use IP tables. But Xiaomi kind of figured figured out that oh um, people do that, so they kind of like hard coded IP addresses in their binaries. Our solution was basically to just, you know, replace their hard-coded IP addresses with our hard-coded IP addresses. So it's just, just an additional step. So uh, as you see, we are kind of aware of what we do, and then we do the same things basically in reverse. Which means uh, we can have our own software and we can redirect traffic. Um, and there's a great software, which is Volatudo, which is developed by Zoom. It's a, completely replace, a complete replacement of the, of the cloud um, applications and API and the, the app itself. It's, so you can run your vacuum robot completely offline with all the functionalities which, which the cloud and the API, uh, so the, the, the smartphone app offers you. You can see live maps, you can edit the maps, you can change the robot configuration. It's a very responsive web interface. Uh, it gives you API for REST uh, and it gives you MQTT functionality, for example, for um, um, Home Assistant. The problem is, I mean, that's not a problem, but that's not my, my personal thing, is uh, zero and lives to write it in JavaScript and so no, no JS. I'm not sure if it's the most performant thing is, but no, it works, so it's, it's fine with me. Uh, some screenshots just to give you like information about how it looks like, so you, you get actually the maps, you can do a lot of interesting things with that. The question is now, how do you get the custom firmware? Um, I made something very, very easy, uh, which is called Dust Builder. It's basically a website where you can let the website build the custom firmware for you. You just you know, upload SSH key and do some other stuff, and it will give you like um, a custom firmware which you can use when to push on your, on your robot. The, the scripts are technically uh, public on the GitHub, so you can just, you know, if you want to reproduce that, you can do that. So, last couple of minutes, that's the reason why I'm getting, getting a little bit faster. Uh, what else did we find on the robots while we do uh, research? Linux operation system robots. So all the devices use the video for Linux subsystem, and you can access the cameras uh, through their um, device, um, um, file basically, 
and some of the vendors were even nice enough to let uh, some, deb some debugging tools to you know, debug the camera on the device. And I just want to give you some, some examples. Uh, this is a, a B10S from Roborock. I made self, so it's self-aware, it makes a selfie of itself. And you see kind of like the quality again from the optical sensors. Um, for the L10S Ultra, they gave it a um, RGB camera, which is also nice. So you see again a selfie of a robot. Uh, with the DEFCON flag, and uh, on the right, like what's typical, what it typically see uh, with, with the camera, it kind of starts with the AI, with the um, um, object in your house. Uh, this is the same example for uh, the uh, Roborock S8. It has an infrared camera, so the sad thing is on the right, as you see there, um, it looks a little bit bland. Um, this is the blue elephant, so you cannot see the blue in the picture, which is kind of sad, but um, it's okay. I mean, you s still see the optical sensor sees something, right? Um, so something about the Dreamy. The good news is this year we didn't find any SSH credentials to so back in the firmware, so that's good. They, they made a lot of improvements in the software. The bad news is they started to introduce a lot of telemetry and calling home functions, which is a little bit sad. And they started to enforce geo-blocking by IP address. So if you buy a device from China again, you cannot use it anywhere outside of China. You need to kind of do some hacking, I guess. Um, there were a couple problems. Um, the part of an ex like packages, audio are not signed or encrypted. Thing you can do technically, and don't do that because it's probably illegal in your, in your jurisdiction. You can just overwrite this prompt, this warning prompt, which the robot will kind of blare out every three minutes by an empty file, and then you can access the camera without anyone noticing. Really, do it. Um, the the thing is, uh, you can do it also for non devices. Which um, one interesting thing is, um, Dreamy kind of messed up. By the way, the firmware signatures. Um, so we didn't really use that, but I mean, it's kind of interesting. So we use encryption and signing, and the way how we do that is very interesting. The AutoZip archive is encrypted with a static. When they create a, um, a random file, and then they use random file, so I think someone had a good effort. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, we were not sure if it was a trick or if they kind of messed up. It was kind of a little bit weird. Anyway, so last two slides. Um, as a summary, uh, we have routing methods for the most uh, current, uh, so most of the current uh, released uh, Dream Rock robots, and we can bypass security mechanisms. Um, we even routed devices which came out two weeks ago. So um, basically, we are at the cut. Um, we get persistence and we can run our custom firmware. Um, now we can validate and validate vendors' claims, and the bad news is some of them are tricky. Um, even if you're not doing any robot hacking, the bootloader attack is technically applicable for many, many different other devices. Um, we saw it in, like I said, smart speakers and other, other things. And this routing allows us basically to do further research into IoT and AI because now we have access to the AI machine learning models and we can basically take a look at and compare them like more in a more um, qualitative way. So, the final note. Um, do not use your knowledge for bad things. I mean, I know people like to, to have the word burn down, but um, please don't do that. Um, help us to help others. Um, so if you have a routing PCB, um, share it with other people as soon as you're done. Uh, we will publish the tool in a couple of years, some of, uh, so next couple of years, <laughs> next couple of days. Um, so some of them are already public, some of them will be enabled in the next couple of hours when I'm kind of getting cooled down. Uh, so please be patient if some things are public yet. Um, if you happen to be at Hardware I.O. in the Netherlands uh, in October or November, in the beginning of November, uh, feel free to join me. I might be there with some new things regarding and not these robots, but some completely new company. All right. Um, final thing.
Thankfully, we have no brick devices so far, but I mean, it could have happened, and this would be kind of sad. I got like an email from one of the people like, oh, my wife would kill me if I destroyed this device, so let's hope that um, it doesn't break. All right, and that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for being here again at 10 a.m. in the morning. Um, I think we don't have time for Q&A, but if you have questions, just send me an email, um, Telegram, um, Twitter. If you want a routing adapter, I have PCBs here, so just hit me up. Thank you very much. Thank you.